All right, well, we're in Acts chapter 16 this morning, but uh, we're going to pray one more time and just simply, Father, that your Holy Spirit, Lord, would just illuminate and reveal to us, God, your will. Lord, we just confess to you right now that our flesh will get in between us and your will, Lord God. Our, our stubbornness, Lord, and our resistance to the things that you have, Lord God, will just make this another um, relay of knowledge. And so, Father, we just pray that your Holy Spirit would just take your good word, plant it, water it, give the increase, and change us as we sing from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, so we left off last week having completed Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Council, and we looked at how there was a church meeting necessary to resolve the issue of how Gentiles were to be saved and how that they did not have to become circumcised, and it ended with uh, James, a leader in the church, half-brother of Jesus, uh, giving the final uh, speech, if you will. Uh, but it also ended in a way that was um, a reality check for us as Christians, because we saw that uh, Paul and Barnabas parted ways because they disputed over what we're entering into today, and that's the second missionary journey, and who to take along the trip. And it was over John Mark, and remember that we had talked about earlier how he had forsaken them, we don't know the reason why, but on one hand, Paul said, hey, and you get the sense that he's kind of a type A personality, you know, he left us before, he could leave us again, we get somebody else, and that's probably the way his thinking was. And we know that Barnabas is described as a son of encouragement, and was thinking, hey, I, the Lord gave you grace, Saul of Tarsus, we should give John Mark grace. And so they ended up dividing and going separate ways, and, and twice the ministry happens. But the point that we brought up last week was that, you know, it didn't have to end that well because we really don't know if Paul and Barnabas ever got reconciled because we really don't see them ever ministering together and how, um, number one, you know, we're, we've got skin on. We're Christians, and we're going to have conflict. And so we shouldn't be surprised when that happens. But also, too, realize that it doesn't have to happen that way, that we can disagree in a way of, uh, that has a spirit of humility and long-suffering and meekness, right? And so uh, what we're going to see in Acts chapter 16 is we're going to see the heart of Paul because he's not just an evangelist. A lot of times we think of an evangelist and we think, you know, get saved, amen, end of story, bye-bye, and that's it. But Paul also has the heart of a shepherd, and the heart of a shepherd says, get saved, grow, not bye-bye, hello, because you need to grow every day. And if we're not going forward, we're going backwards. And I was thinking about my, uh, my oldest son. Any of you, are any of you here note takers, journalers, where you write stuff down, you kind of document things? I've, I've got uh, books on everybody in my family, uh, immediate family. <laughs> 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 Don't want to lie. Uh, and... Uh, I have an entry for my son Jacob because he, uh, there was a point where he was witnessing to somebody over the phone and just making a case for Christ. You know, as a dad, you're like, yeah, you know, it's just very inspiring and just motivates you. But you know that over time, you want to see, just like any good parent, you want to see your kids grow and mature and get stronger and learn things and live it out. And so he and uh, his best friend the other night uh, came and we were uh, talking about uh, some friends of theirs because they had gone into an area, a dark area, and they were seeking counsel and wanting to know the godly way to approach them. And, and again, the heart of a shepherd says, yes, yes, we can do that. We can work with that. In fact, let's go to the word of God and let, let's give a reason for why we have a problem with the darkness. But again, that's the heart of a shepherd. And we're going to see that with Paul because he's going to go back after uh, what we estimate to be about five years. And he's going to go back to churches and cities and people that have been established in the Lord and make sure that they're solid. And I think that's important to know because, you know, a lot of times Christianity can be very emotionally manipulative. You know, you get a big crusade together, you get killer music going, you get, give an altar call, people raise their hands, you think, all right, this is it. But we have to be careful that that isn't just the realm of excitement and emotion because you got to go to work the next day, right? And you got to deal with family the next day and you got to be able to live. You got to show me how to live. And I, and I believe we're going to see that uh, with Paul here in Acts chapter 16. But at the end of 15, um, 
It says, uh, verse 40, But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. And so, um, Peter, um, so we've got uh, Barnabas and John Mark, and we've got uh, Paul and Silas. Uh, just real quick, uh, John Mark ends up being a significant person in the scripture. Uh, 1 Peter 5 says that uh, Peter speaks to John Mark, who took um, who he took with him, and you can imagine what a blessing John Mark had been for, for Peter, because remember that um, Peter had denied the Lord. Remember, he had the whole rooster crowing thing, and uh, so John the Mark uh, could be a comfort to him, uh, because he had, for whatever reason, you know, forsook the missionary trip, and so we see two guys there, uh, both needing God's grace, which I think applies to everybody in this room this morning, because we blow it every day of our lives, okay? So, um, but he did write in 1 Peter five thirteen, she who is in Babylon, elect together with you, greets you, and so does Mark, my son. So, uh, and then John Mark's gonna, gonna go on to write the Gospel of Mark, which is really cool, especially if you have ADD. I'd say I see that hand, but you've already thought about something else, so. Uh, tradition says that Mark is associated with the establishment of the Alexandrian church, uh, Paul, at the end of his life, says in 2 Timothy, uh, speaking of Mark, uh, only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for ministry. So we see reconciliation there. We see restoration. And that's God's heart. That's what he wants to do. So, um, so there was reconciliation. Don't know how long it took, but now we're at the second missionary journey. Uh, uh, Barnabas taking John Mark. They're going to go to Cyprus. Uh, and that's Barnabas's hometown. It's an island. Uh, they're going to take a boat, whereas Paul and Silas are going to go north, and they're going to go overland. Uh, just some background on Silas. He's called Silas in Acts and Silvanus in the epistles. I just don't know how you name a kid Silvanus, but hey, you know, more power to him. Um, he, like, <laughs> he, like Barnabas, was a leader in the Jerusalem church. Uh, he's closely associated with Paul. Um, like Barnabas and Paul, he was a prophet. We see that in Acts 15.32. He's called an apostle in 1 Thessalonians 2.6. Um, like Paul, he's a Roman citizen. And like John Mark, Silas is also associated with Peter, possibly even acting as a scribe. The second missionary journey, it takes much longer than the first one, possibly three to four years. And it's primarily focused in Macedonia and Achaia, uh, which is modern Greece. So again, we see the heart of Paul. He's not just an evangelist, uh, the heart of a shepherd. He wants to see growth sustained. So he goes back to Derby. Let's everybody say Derby this morning together. Derby, just to see if you're awake. Calistra, Iconium, wanting to cover the same ground and then spread further west is his desire. Remember that Jesus said to his disciples, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. And I ordained you that you should go out and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain. So Paul is interested in the fruit that remains, just like Jesus is. And uh, again, um, you know, just maybe a question before we get into the text here is, are you remaining? Are you growing right now here this morning? Um, or have things gotten stagnant? Have you fallen away? So uh, he's gonna go back over those areas. He's gonna strengthen the church. That's what the, uh, the team does. Um, but he's not going to go to all the places that he wants to go. The Holy Spirit's actually going to say, no, don't go here. Isn't that weird? You don't normally think of the Holy Spirit as saying, no, don't preach the gospel someplace. In fact, the majority of the time, don't we have to go to the Holy Spirit just to be able to witness to somebody? Because we're in our life, and we're used to what we've got going on. But yet we're going to read about the Holy Spirit directing and guiding and saying, don't go here, but go here. And, and that's the secret to their success. So, uh, interesting, um, Paul has to be flexible. He has to be able to roll with what the Spirit tells him to do. You know, for some of us that are getting older, and I'm not looking at anybody right now, <laughs> that could be hard to do. Unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Amen. Amen, I am old. I am old. In fact, I've been called the old man Ryan recently. I'm not going to say who called me that, but um, somebody in this room. So, uh, 
It has been said that God won't lead you where the grace of God can't keep you. So wherever you are in God's will this morning, God's resources and God's grace are there for you to keep you in the situation you are. So we're going to see how God guides Paul differently than he thought. Here's something that Skip Heitzig shared that got my attention that um, I think my flesh and your flesh is resistant to. He said, God is more anxious to guide you than you are to be guided. What if his guidance is in a difficult spot? What if he deliberately leads you to a place of sacrifice, to a place of difficulty? We have to trust, again, that he's going to get us through that because if he's doing that, he's doing it for a reason and he's going to complete it, right? Isn't that the verse? Mark brought up the verse this morning that he who has begun a good work in you, he's faithful to complete that work. So it's his desire that you and I fall into his design for our life and he's provided a way whereby we can know his will, his word, uh, is going to give that direction. So in this room right now, if we were to tune in to the right receiver, we'd have all kinds of voices being played, all kinds of video could be brought up right now. In fact, if you're on your phone, you may be doing that right now and ignoring me. I don't know. But the truth of the matter is, is that it's, a, it's here, and you and I need to be able to tune into to decipher the general, general principles of his word so that we can know his mind daily and then walk by faith in it. And the funny thing is, is that when you've been in communication with somebody, you don't have to figure out what they're trying to tell you. You get it. So, uh, yeah, let's get into the text. Uh, Acts 16. Um, my uh, stuff didn't print them, didn't come out of my Kindle today, so I'm not as fast moving as uh, normally. So I'm going to go ahead and just read the first 14 verses and then go back. So, uh, then he came to Derby and Lystra, speaking of Paul. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and he took him and circumcised him. Wow. <laughs> because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And when they had gone through uh, Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course uh, to that place, Samothrace, and the next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Okay, I lied. First 13 verses. Okay. So, first off, they came to Derby and Lystra. And there's a certain disciple there named Timothy. Uh, he's a son of a certain Jewish woman who believed but his father was Greek. So Tim's going to be his main companion for the next 15 to 18 years. He's going to say at the end of his life, man, it's only him that I trust in regards to taking over the churches in a certain area. He calls him his own son in the faith. And then verse 2, when it says he was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium, um, we see Paul here having started in Iconium he first goes north and then west and then through Tarsus, uh, through the areas of Derby and Lystra. And they get to Derby, the place where they had great success the first time around. Great response to the gospel. But remember what happened in Lystra. It was so weird. Because, I mean, the people there were very fickle because at first they're thinking of them as like they're these pagan gods and they want to offer like oxen and, and, and make sacrifice to them. And then before, not too long before that, then they end up 
stoning him, you know? So that's ministry for you. <laughs> Welcome. And so it's a fair weather friend response. But you know that the Spirit is with them, and you know that you know that the Holy Spirit is with them because they go back and they continue to speak to them. They continue to minister to them, and they're not bitter. You know, they didn't have these meetings like, what's up with these Lystrans, <laughs> you know? And I think, wow, God. On the one hand, you think, how do you, how do you survive something like that? You know, it just sounds, it sounds so incredible, and yet at the same time, you and I have the living God inside of us today. We've got the Holy Spirit, and he's got a Macedonian call on each one of our lives. Here's the, here's the rub, though. Are we going to take the time to talk to somebody else? Are we going to get out of our comfort zone and say, you know what, here's Jesus. This is what he's done in my life, and it's been promised in his word. And we get to do that every day. And sometimes, doesn't it take a review of what God has done in your life to just kind of stop and say, wow, Lord, where would I be without you? What would I have in my life? Who would I have in my life without you? And so he's, you know, so he's going back. Some estimate that it's been five years uh, in between uh, the first and second journey here. And, uh, you know, you kind of have to wonder because they had to leave real suddenly. Um, you know, what did I leave behind? Um, in Lystra there, there wasn't time to train up great leadership and to do great discipleship, uh, maybe the way that he would have wanted to. But they end up turning out disciples like Timothy. See, that's how our Jesus is. On the one hand, if you take into consideration, you just look at, well, this is what man has done, or, you know, Paul and Barnabas blew it. Well, God says, you know what, I'll just divide and go off and cover more ground. On the other hand, in Lystra, you look at the ministry and you say, wow, they didn't have enough time to train up leadership and discipleship, and God says, you know what, here's Timothy. Here's a man like nobody else. This guy's going to be with Paul for 15 to 18 years. So the question is, why am I looking at me? Why am I not looking at him? Because he's not going to fail and he's not going to fall short. If I look at me, oh yeah, just talk to my wife. Talk to my kids. Talk to my coworkers. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall short. But it's not about me and it's not about you. It's about Jesus Christ. Okay, so verse 3, Paul wanted to have him go on with him, and, and this gets interesting. He took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Okay, so Tim would have been led to the faith by the ministry of Paul. What Paul does here is consistent with his heart, mind, and theology, Okay, just to get an idea of what this was like, okay, in this area, this is kind of a, a large village type of life, lifestyle, where everybody knows everybody. I know it's hard to imagine because we live in a booming metropolitan city like St. Joe, but imagine if you're from Gower or Savannah or something like that, you know, everybody knows everybody. Everybody knows everybody's business. So Timothy walks into a synagogue, they're going to know a few things about him. They're going to know that his mom was Jewish. They're going to know that his dad was Greek. Um, they would say that in some ways he was raised as a Greek and not as a Jew. And so this has to do, this circumcision has to do with his effectiveness in service. And it's not about salvation. Because that was determined in the last chapter. That's important to note. So it ends up going to say for you and I today, there are a lot of things that we do in the ministry today that have to do with effectiveness in service and are not about our salvation. But it's about love. And it didn't get any better than that because that's the best reason. He loved us. We love him because he first loved us. So he takes Tim, he circumcises him. I'm not even making any comment about that, but you can tell... Um, it, it just sounds ironic. He takes Tim, he circumcises him so he can tell the Gentile believers they don't have to be circumcised to be believers. They would have considered him Jewish, but without circumcision, he would have lost an inroad with Jewish unbelievers. Paul's going to try to hit a, hit a synagogue. That's his custom every time they go to a city. But he does say in 1 Corinthians 9.19, For though I am free from all men, I've made myself a servant to all uh, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew uh, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law as under the law that I might win those who are under the law. 
To those who are without law, as without law, not being without law toward God, but under law toward Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak, and I love this, to the weak I became as weak, that I might win the weak. And I have become all things to all men that I might by all means save some. And here's the reason he does it, for the sake of the gospel. And that's good news. Because then it's not gonna be about um, what somebody does, but it's about what Jesus did. So again, he circumcises Timothy not for salvation, not to contradict what he did in Acts chapter 15, but to be a more successful evangelist. But you know, it's gonna depend upon the situation because if you look at Galatians 2, 3, he refuses to circumcise Titus. So again, this is the spirit leading and it's flexibility. And again, sometimes we think, you know, you can look at people and you can look at their talents and their abilities and you can think, well, I'm not like him or I can't do what she does. But a better question that the Lord and the Spirit might ask you is, well, are you available? Because if you are and you can flex and you can bend and you can be spirit-led, he can use you. And then it doesn't matter what he can do or what she can do because we're doing it together, amen? So... Um, at verse four, as they went through the cities, they delivered to them the decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. And verse six, the Macedonian call. And when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, <laughs> they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And when I say Asia, that's the Roman conception of Asia. Um, it would be Asia Minor. And we're gonna look at Ephesus, which is a major city, one of the great cities of the ancient world. How important is it to be led by the Spirit? I think some days it's the difference between reading the Word of God and it's like devotion. Check in, check off, check out, I'm done. I just read the Word of God. Spirit of God comes and you say, Holy Spirit, work through me. Father, you know what, I've blown it. Father, or you know what, Lord, um, I want more of you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit as I read your word of God. Lord, I wanna be a part of this, I wanna be active in this. When it says to repent in the scripture, Lord, I wanna repent. When it says to praise in the scripture, I wanna praise. And God says, okay, I can work with you. And I'm gonna make this, it's a living, vital, real thing. So. How important is it to be led by the Spirit? Well, A.W. Tozer said if they didn't have the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts, 95% of what they did would have halted. Important to note, that's how important. So he usually has to prompt us to share, not to forbid us to do so. So this is different. Verse seven and eight. So after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. Mysia is an ethnic area in the northwest of the Roman province of Asia Minor. Uh, it was mountainous with uh, several major Roman roads, and its major cities were Troas, Asus, and Pergamum. They never intended to go to Troas. It was like their third choice. But it was the Holy Spirit's plan to go there, which is always the best plan. So, um, it's the Holy Spirit's plan to lead him there. Paul, beautifully responsive to the Holy Spirit, was willing to lay down his will and his plans for the direction that the Holy Spirit brings. I want to suggest to you that's not easy for a type A personality. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that all the time a type A personality just says, yes, Lord, let's change, blend, and, <laughs> and flex. <laughs> you know? A lot of times type A personality says, no, <laughs> I will not do that. And then God says, okay. I'll, I'll let you have what you want, and then I'll get you to the point where you want what I want. And that's not reserved just for type A personalities. It's for B, C, and D, too. Amen. Right on. You're with me. Somebody. Anybody. Okay, thank you. All right. It's good not to be alone up here. So, uh, never intended to go to Traz. It was third on their list. Uh, Paul uh, is guided here. And, uh, you know, sometimes God guides by closing doors in as much as he does when he opens doors. So David Livingston wanted to go to China. God sent him to Africa, okay? Uh, William Carey wanted to go to Polynesia. God sent him to India. Adoniram Judge, uh, Judson went to India, but God guided him to Burma. So God guides us, God guides us, that's hard to say, along the way, to just the right place. 
verses 9 and 10. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. This is Europe, okay? So now, now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. So the word we that we read about in verse 10 now puts Luke in the Gospel of Acts for the first time. We don't know why Luke is in Troas, but he joins Paul, Silas, Timothy there. So from now on, we refers to Luke. Here the Holy Spirit says yes, verse 11. Therefore, trailing, or I'm sorry, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, <laughs> and the next day came to Neapolis. Now we read a straight course in the New King James. It's actually a nautical term, and it means the wind was blowing at the back of the boat. In one day, they come to Samothrace, and then in less than a day to Philippi. So in less than two days, they're able to get from Troas to Philippi. But if you were to jump ahead to chapter 20, verse 6, you're going to see when they're coming back in the other direction, it takes five days to come across that body of water. So, and then sometimes back then, if the wind was contrary, the boat had to kind of tack back and forth with the sail to capture the wind. So Paul says basically that God propelled us the way to go. It's interesting that the word pneuma in Greek for the spirit, and that's where we were Wednesday night downstairs when we were in Christianity 201, it means both spirit and breath. So it's interesting, in fact, it's usually the word for breath. So what's true for the body of Christ is that unless breath, the spirit of God is in the body, the body's dead, just like in the physical. Here, the Holy Spirit literally breathes and just propels them and, and lets them get, get there in an in unnatural capacity. So it's the vitalizing breath of the body of the church. It's the spirit of Christ. Verse 12, And from there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. Okay, let's talk about Philippi, all right? It's a colony. Uh, Augustus Caesar had granted Philippi what was called uh, Jus Italicum, which I will not make any jokes about, but there, it was a Roman city. Uh, it meant that none of the officials or magistrates or judges um, would have been local. They would have all been from Rome. And what had happened in that city is that Philip of Macedon, remember, uh, who was he the father of? Alexander the Great. So uh, his dad, Philip had subdued it, and the city had been named after him originally. 42 years before Christ, Octavius and Anthony defeated Cassius and Brutus, which sounds like a cartoon character, uh, at a major battle there. And then Philippi becomes a Roman province. So then all the things that held true in Rome held true in Philippi. You want to keep that in mind? Verse 13 says, On the Sabbath day we went out of the city to the riverside, and when it says the riverside, that's the Gangites River, which is still there today, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. So this is the first sermon in Europe, and it's a discussion. Now, we find out from where they don't go that there weren't 10 Jewish males in this city, okay? Because Paul normally goes to a synagogue when he first goes to a church, right? So according to Jewish law, a synagogue could be established if there were at least 10 Jewish men to preside over the dealings of that synagogue. So not uh, 10 Jewish men there. Um, the fact that he goes out of the city to a river and they sat at the river shows that it's a Jewish gag, uh, gathering, not a synagogue. Now it's interesting, if I could have your attention here, um, they go to a river because the Jews called a running stream back then living water. That's pretty interesting. Sure, in the Old Testament scriptures, gathering together around living water, talking about Jesus Christ, who is the source of living water. So there's living water, and they, uh, there they can have rituals of cleansing called the mikvah, and that was a cleansing bath for worship. So it's the closest thing that they have to a synagogue. So out in the open sky, they're able to have prayer, they're able to get in the word together, they're able to, to share together. 
And I think, you know what, that's something, I know that this is something that's on Mike Brock's heart, is to have like a, a get together just to get out of the building. Because the church is not the building. It's people. We are living stones. We're not confined to the sheep shed. And that's why it's written up there. It says you're now entering your mission field. The more we get out there, I think the more people are gonna come in here. But the truth of the matter is, is that it's not the physical environment because what I talked about was singing together, praying together, going through what baptism together, it's us being together. That's what makes us, the church, the living stones. So more than likely, Claudius, uh, the emperor had kicked the Jews out from Rome, and Philippi as a colony would have done the same thing. So this place, this riverside, uh, the Gangites, uh, would have been uh, officially sanctioned by the leaders in Philippi, and that's where prayer would have been allowed, um, and it would have been a place for other faiths other than you know, the Roman pantheon of gods for, for the Jewish uh, people, people that believed in the monotheistic faith could come to pray. Uh, we're wrapping up, uh, verse 14 says, Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshiped God. And I love this. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. It was God that did it. So, in this chapter, as we'll continue on, there have been, I'm sure there's many conversions that are happening, but in this chapter, there are going to be three that are mentioned. Thyatira is a trading city known for its purple dye that was used to make purple clothes. Um, evidently, Lydia was a businesswoman. She moved from Thyatira to Philippi to get into this, this trade, this marketing. You remember how uh, clothes were dyed purple back then? There was like this certain shellfish, and it was called a uh, mirac, and it excreted a fine purple dye. It was so expensive that a pound of material that was dyed purple in its raw form cost over 300 bucks back then. Yeah, my kids are not doing that. Just, just saying. So, <laughs> clear, yeah. I just, I don't know, I just can't help thinking, well, how did that come about? Was somebody just sitting around, they're like, you know, I'm bored. Let's go, because I think they got this dye out of the throat of that shellfish, <laughs> you know, so... How did, how did they find that out, you know? What are you going to do this weekend? I don't I, Netflix, I don't know. How about you? What are you going to do? I think I'm going to look in the throat of a shellfish. <laughs> you know, I just got a hankering. So I don't know how that happened. <laughs> I'm weird like that. But um, Lydia is a very wealthy businesswoman. Uh, she's an entrepreneur. She has her own business. She doesn't have a husband. She doesn't have children. She doesn't have any attachments. Um, she has a house that she invites Paul and company into, and we'll see that in verse 40. She's able to invite the entire church into her home. So she has a large home. She's very blessed. She's making time for God on the Sabbath. I gotta tell you, that is probably our biggest opponent in what you and I do in that we are way busy. Way too busy for the things of God. And you can talk to unbelievers, for example, and one of the most common things you hear is you're sharing with them and you're witnessing to them is like, well, Sunday's my only day off. You know, God gives me every day. Every day is a gift from him that he gives you and I today. And so, you know, um, some people, I've, I, one guy I work with said, um, I can fish on Sundays, and he says, the great outdoors is my church. But you know what? The church of the people. So that's not a true statement because we're not there. If you're fishing, be a fisher of men. Fish with men, okay? So, you know, some people say the golf course, you know, or whatever is my church. I disagree. I'm not crazy about the golf clothes either, but hey, that's just me. So she's got a hunger for God. <laughs> now that I've offended all the golfers, she's the, no offense to Joe. Yeah, no offense to Joe. And there's, uh, she's there by the river, and the language indicates she's a proselyte. So she's a convert to Judaism, very religious, but not saved. We enter into another type of person, especially here in the Midwest, that we, can, we converse with. Um, it's possible to be very sincere. It's possible to be very religious. It's possible to be a moral person, to be devout, and yet not saved. She's not saved, okay? So rich young ruler was like that. 
Jesus goes and he talks to him and he's able to heart do a heart diagnosis and say, here's the one thing you lack. Take all your goods, sell them to the poor. And he went away sorrowful. So um, little gods, material things stood in the way. But then you got a lot of people like Nicodemus who's sincere and he's a guy who's a leader. Sometimes we get intimidated by people like that because if we're, we're talking with them or we're, we're witnessing to them, we're sharing truth with them, we think that because they're successful in the world that somehow they don't need Jesus but they have sinned, successful or not. And that's the issue. And we didn't write this, right? So if God says this, because I had a um, discussion yesterday with a New Age guy in a Christian bookstore um, over truth. But he's a sinner just like I am. And he needs Jesus just like I do. And, and Jesus is not the next phase of Buddha, <laughs> okay? He's different. He's the son of God. He's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. And so what was true for Lydia and what was true for the rich young ruler, what's true for Nicodemus is true for you and I. And maybe this morning this describes you. So I'm going to invite uh, Bobby and Mark to come up here uh, because if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, now is the time. And I'm going to ask you saints right now to bow your heads with me. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. Father God, I don't ever want to presume, Lord, that there isn't an opportunity here this morning for somebody that is yet to say yes to Jesus, to yet to make him the Lord of their life. Father God, I don't want to go before you one day in heaven to give an account for my life and to say, you know what? I just wasn't in the mood to share the gospel and an opportunity for somebody to go right. And, and this morning, Lord God, you are presenting that to anybody in this room if they will believe with their heart and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ took their sin upon him so that their sins, past, present, and future, will be dealt with because of what you did on the cross. But you know what, Father God, this is not persuasion, this is not coercion, and this is not emotional. Lord God, this is spiritual. This is eternal. I'm just going to be blunt, Father God. I don't want anybody in this room to go to hell because that is forever. And you will regret this moment for the rest of your life if you do not say yes to Jesus Christ right now. And in your heart right now, you can say, Jesus, I have blown it. Jesus, I've tried to be religious. Jesus, I have tried to go through the motions. I've tried to let my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds. Whatever, whatever is the case, Father God, right now, save them from their sin, cause them to repent, and that means to turn towards you. And Lord Jesus, help them to join our family, the, the church, the living stones. And I just pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's people said, yeah. amen. I'm gonna stand up and worship one more time.